actually 8.1 we had an addendum there and this is uh, covered California's emergency regulation authority Uh, Adam Dorsey, Department of Finance. So the um, the benefits exchange is um, uh, requesting an, uh, a change in their statute to uh, basically extend the um, time in which they can adopt emergency regulations, and this will give um, Cover California the time to um, do analysis of their major regulations and comply with um, ever changing federal requirements on health exchanges. Thank you, sir. Questions from the committee. Senator Bell. Now, th this doesn't ex extend any terms or anything of the, it just deals with extension of the authority, right? The, the language uh, deals with extension of the authority to do emergency regs. And Senator Mitchell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. We spent a lot of time uh, in this body talking about transparency of the process and making sure that general public has access to information and can participate and I fully understand the need for the emergency regulatory process at the front end but to extend it for two years for me feels a little excessive it's my understanding that Covered California has been in the process of working on permanent regs so emergency regs kind of removes the time frame to allow for public input um, and so I'm, I'm having some heartburn over this issue so if they could justify why they need emergency regulation time frame extended for another two years I'd appreciate that because at this point I'm not inclined to support it can I ask you how you would feel about extending it for one year I'd have less heartburn about half <laughs> <laughs> one Tums could help versus two yes yeah. <laughs> one year I could possibly support but, right. but two today I'm inclined not to support finance if you want to respond yeah so uh, I think that a one-year extension would, would be, um, you know, suitable and would help us, um, you know, get our ducks in a row and, and get permanent regulations. Would together. it cause you any heartburn? <laughs> Very, half the heartburn, I think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Uh, public comment. Beth Capel on behalf of Health Access California. Like Senator Mitchell, we were having considerable heartburn over the notion of being surprised at the extension of emergency reg authority for two years. We do not oppose a one-year extension. Thank you. Mr. Chair and members, Elizabeth Landsberg with the Western Center on Law and Poverty. We, too, were surprised by this proposal. We've been working diligently with Covered California. We appreciate the transparency they have had, but we've been working as assuming there would be a permanent reg process. So we'd have less concern with a one-year extension, but would be very concerned with a two-year emergency regulatory authority and the precedent that that would set. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Landsberg. No more public comment. I'm going to take a motion from Senator Bell, which would adopt placeholder trailer bill language to extend California cover California's emergency regulation authority by one year. And we will call the roll. Leno? Aye. Nielsen? Aye. Anderson? Aye. Bell? Aye. Berryhill? Bloss? Aye. Corbett? Aye. Hancock? Aye. Jackson? Aye. Lou? Mitchell? Aye. Monning? Aye. Morell? Roth? Aye. Torres? Wyland? That's 11 zero. That measure passes 11 zero. Page nine is the Department of Social Services. Um, yes, uh, this is um, a new uh, benefit that we were proposing in the May revision. Um, uh, really responding to some, to some changes at the federal level in the in the most recent farm bill. Um, the title of this new subsidy program is the State Utility Assistance Subsidy Program. Um, in the Farm Bill, um, there was a, a change um, related to um, who would be eligible uh, for CalFresh benefits um, related to uh, the benefit they receive from the Low-Income Home Energy Assistance Program. Um, prior uh, to the passage of that bill, we had been providing a nominal benefit of about uh, a dime um, to, to individuals, and that was That's allowing... a dime per year? Um, Correct, yes. Um, and that was allowing those individuals to qualify for a significant you know, sum of, of food stamps that they otherwise were not eligible for. So the federal government has changed their rules um, requiring now an annual subsidy amount of $20. And so this proposal um, would provide uh, monies uh, to ensure that we continue to um, uh, 
um, have those individuals um, uh, be able to be eligible for the food stamp benefit um, that they otherwise would not be if we did not um, provide the money for that life benefit. Um, so that's that's really the it's a 11.8 million dollar um, total cost um, related to this program. And 10.9 of that is general fund, but also should be noted that the near 350,000 households that would get an increase of about 62 dollars. Again, that's not per month, that's per year. Or is that per month? That is per month, okay. Uh, the cost of the general fund would be offset by the sales tax that we would get with the purchases that they would make. So that's about 3.6 million. LAO? Sorry, Jacob, we're Department of Finance. That, that's correct, there would be some, some offsetting um, you know, benefit to the general fund, although it's not, it's not, I mean, it would be picked up in essentially just the, the normal revenue projections. I mean, it wouldn't be something that we would score. All right. LAO, your thoughts? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ryan Woolsey with the Legislative Analyst Office. We don't raise any issues with this proposal, but we do note that previously the nominal light heat benefit, the utility benefit, was provided with federal funds. These new utility benefits, the $20 and one cent benefits, will be provided with general fund in the budget year. Um, this is because of some uh, legitimate barriers to, to using the federal funds as we did before. We understand that the administration is looking into the possibility of transitioning back to federal funding and we will monitor um, that as we go forward to look at the, the merits of that um, decision. Thank you, Mr. Wilsey. Approve this, but I move the recommendation. Thank you, Senator budget. Hancock. We do have a motion to approve this proposal by the governor. And yes. Kathy Moster, representing the California Food Policy Advocates, just want to go on record. We support this administrative proposal, appreciate them moving forward uh, to deal with federal change in guidelines, and we agree with uh, what the chair has commented on the additional dollars into the system. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mossberg. Uh, Mike Carroll with the Western Center on Law and Poverty, and we also are in support of this. Thank you, Mr. Harold. We have a motion by Senator Hancock. If there are no other questions or comments from the committee, we call the roll. Leno? Aye. Nielsen? Aye. Anderson? Aye. Bell? Aye. Berryhill? Block? Aye. Corbett? Aye. Hancock? Aye. Jackson? Aye. Lou? Mitchell? Aye. Monning? Aye. Morrell? Roth? Aye. Torres? Wylan? 11-0. 11-0. motion passes. Page 10 is a conforming item. Ms. Bosler. Thank you. Yes, a conforming item to page 14, so we'll take that up at that time. And we'll move on to uh, the drought food assistance program as proposed. Sure. Um, as, as all of you are aware, um, the state is really facing um, the third year of an um, unprecedented drought in California. Um, we are expecting a significant uh, uh, hardship in areas, especially area, um, areas of the state, especially areas that are heavily dependent on agriculture, um, because we do anticipate that there will be fields left fallow this year um, because uh, the water allocations from the state water project and the Central Valley project are quite um, limited. Um, so we did um, appropriate uh, an additional five million general fund, and we were able to move uh, 15 million of the appropriation that was made in er legislation earlier this year, SB 103, um, into the budget year for a total of 20 million um, for uh, this um, needed assistance um, around the state. Um, in, in drought impacted areas and we also proposed budget bill language to allow us to augment that if there was continued and sustained um, extraordinary need um, th that uh, we needed to address. Thank you, Ms. Bosler. So I have a note that by May 23rd, the department will have requested to expend just 10 million of the 25 million. Can you help us with why this is being expended so slowly when we know the need is so great? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, um, uh, you know, that we've been doing a lot um, to really uh, have a better understanding of what the impacts are out there. Um, a lot of who is being impacted um, are farm um, workers. Uh, most of their work is very seasonal and, um, uh, and is really at its peak uh, during harvest season, which is later in the summer. Um, and so uh, the Department of Social Services has been um, coordinating uh, very closely with local food banks, local food pantries um, to have an understanding of what is going on the ground and then only sending out um, uh, the food uh, uh, when a plan is in place and an understanding of what the additional incremental uh, need um, is um, in, the, in those areas. So. Um, that, that is true, um, but we are anticipating increased need later in the summer, um, really co corresponding with the, the, um, the harvest season. I'm sure the need and the demand will increase as the summer passes, but I can't buy the argument that there's not an unfulfilled need now. So I think it can, no concerns, not just me, that the money's there, the hunger's there, and we've got to be doing more to get this out. Yeah, and I think we're, we, are, we are working um, um, very closely with, our, with the local partners um, to understand what they can handle. Um, we're really trying to build on lessons learned from the last um, drought and freeze. Um, we don't want a situation uh, like what happened um, uh, at, during the last drought event in Fresno where some food did, went unused because um, there wasn't a proper distribution methodology um, set Forth. And so I think we've been really trying to be much more, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, focused on planning and making sure that the local infrastructure is there to get the food um, to those uh, that need it um, uh, as soon as possible. Thank you. And I'm going to ask the LAO to walk through the alternative proposal here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The uh, Alternative proposal is to um, adopt the administration's uh, proposal of shifting $15 million of the authority um, between the budget years and then increasing authority by $5 million to get to the $20 million amount, but to remove um, additional budget bill language which would have allowed um, the Department of Finance to further increase authority um, after notifying the Joint Legislative Budget Committee um, should that need arise. Thank you. Any thoughts on the governor's proposal or the alternative? We did not raise any issues with the governor's proposal. Um, however, under the staff recommendation, we don't think that the administration's ability to um, come to the legislature and request further resources as needed would be significantly hindered. All right. Very good. Any uh, comments or questions from the committee? We have a motion by Senator Corbett for the alternative proposal. Senator Nielsen. Well, I just was going to query, uh, Mr. Chairman, would, would you or any members be interested in that caveat of the, uh, of the ledge analyst uh, about the Department of Finance? I mean, this is a proposal I would have liked to have made the motion on, because I represent 10 of these counties. But I think they've made an appropriate uh, point of, uh, of the Department of Finance having some latitude. But the motion's been made, so I'll just make a rhetorical remark. Okay. Thank you for that. Do we have any public comment? If not... Call the roll, please. Leno? Aye. Nielsen? Aye. Anderson? Aye. Bell? Aye. Berryhill? Block? Aye. Corbett? Aye. Hancock? Aye. Jackson? Aye. Liu? Mitchell? Aye. Monning? Aye. Morrell? Roth? Aye. Torres? Wyland? 11 0. Pleasure passes 11 0. Page 12. Not an administration proposal. It is not. <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, Mr. Wilsey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the proposal before you <clears throat> is uh, in relation to the State Emergency Food Assistance Program. Um, in the state of California, authorized distributors, uh, distributors excuse me, receive uh, federal funding in what's called the Emergency Food Assistance Program um, to purchase commodities, um, and distribute those to, to individuals in need. Um, the State um, Emergency Food Assistance Program, or CFAP, was created in 2011 to provide state funds to supplement those federal funds, um, with the additional caveat that the um, commodities be um, produced in the state of California. 
Um, funds in the CFAP program are contingent upon uh, budget appropriations. In the 2013-14 budget, $1 million was appropriated. Um, the uh, proposal before you would approve um, an additional $5 million um, in place of that $1 million, not in addition to for the budget year. I imagine that $1 million has been expended by now. Uh, our understanding is that um, the distributors have until the end of the fiscal year to expend those funds and then they have an additional month to claim. So only a portion have been claimed so far, but we think it's very likely that, they, that the full amount will be claimed by the end of the fiscal year. Very good. So, colleagues, we're on the previous page. We were dealing with the drought food assistance program, which was created with our drought relief package earlier this year. The state emergency food assistance program, as Mr. Wilsey has shared with us, uh, was created. I think it was Assemblyman Fuentes who authored a bill that created this new fund given the great need to address the hunger that exists in our state, people living with lack of access to keep food on their table. Uh, One million initially put into the program, now nearly expended, so this would place another f new five million into the state emergency food assistance program. And we have a motion by Senator Corbett. Any public comment? Hi, Chair and members, Kathy Mossberg again with the California Association of Food Banks. We very much appreciate this um, idea of putting in additional dollar into this and would agree with the comments made previously. Our folks uh, representing the food banks do have additional time until the end of the fiscal year to expend the dollar. We suspect that that will be taking place. There is great need out there in the community. And just there are a number of other states who do this, large states with high poverty rates and high hunger rates. We are one of the few who didn't prior to last year when a million dollars was put in. So we very much appreciate this additional dollar. And for every one million you put in, it allows us to purchase five million dollars in, in meals. So I think it's one of those pieces that a bit of money goes in and a lot comes out. Ms. Mossberg, do you yeah. happen to have the information uh, regarding what other large states with poverty rates not as high as ours, that right. what kind of state assistance they're putting in? We do have that. I don't have that handy, and I apologize for that. I wasn't aware it was going to be on the agenda today, but um, we do know that other states put in 10 million, some put in additional, more or less, um, much higher than California has okay. um, or ever has, but I can provide that to the committee if, you could. if, if that'd you be could, helpful. That'd be helpful. Yeah. Uh, clearly, this is a minimal amount to address the need that's out there, so I'm Happy to see that we have this opportunity to place the five million in it. We have a motion and we'll call the roll. Leno? Aye. Nielsen? No. Anderson? Bell? Aye. Berryhill? Block? Aye. Corbett? Aye. Hancock? Aye. Jackson? Aye. Lou? Mitchell? Aye. Monning? Aye. Morrell? Roth? Aye. Torres? Wyland? Anderson? Anderson, I. That's 10 1. 10 1, the measure passes. Page 13 takes us to the Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. Our re recidivism reduction proposal. Yes. Um, the good work of um, uh, the legislature and the administration last year um, to create the um, Recidivism Reduction Fund um, uh, with savings um, related uh, to uh, fewer contract, um, contract beds um, for our, our state inmates. Um, so we did have, so the May revision est um, estimate of the Recidivism Reduction Fund was around 91 million. Uh, we proposed 49 million of that for community reentry programs with um, some refinement in our May revision to really focus um, those programs um, on uh, the mentally ill offenders that are coming out of state prison. And I just want to reiterate these would be local programs um, that really aid in the reentry of um, our state um, inmates um, reentering the community. Um, 11.8 million um, for substance abuse treatment in the non reentry hubs, um, 11.3 million for the existing integrated services for mentally ill parolees program. Um, 8.3 million to do um, the design work on the Northern California reentry facility in Stockton, um, which is part of our long term um, uh, efforts to um, meet the, the cap. 
um, by the three judge panel. Um, and then 9.7 million um, for various um, therapies at the contract institutions, um, including substance abuse treatment um, and other um, be cognitive behavioral therapies. And then finally, um, in the May revision, we also included a proposal for 867,000 for the initial planning um, of a California Leadership Academy, um, which would really um, start to do uh, some groundwork on um, some demonstration um, of uh, best practices um, for a certain uh, uh, um, group of inmates that are currently in our um, state institutions. Young for some offenders. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Bosler. Uh, colleagues, I believe, and Senator Hancock may speak to this if she would like, that the subcommittee had rejected the governor's proposal, and we have a new package, which I would ask the LAO to walk us through. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Aaron Edwards with the Legislative Analyst's Office. So the Senate has uh, it's a alternative package here. Uh, it includes the $91 million in recidivism reduction funds, as well as another $5 million from the um, Inmate Welfare Fund, and then about $44 million from the General Fund. Uh, so I'll walk through those <clears throat> uh, at a pretty high level. Uh, let me first start with the proposals from the Re Recidivism Reduction Fund, and I'll highlight a couple areas where uh, the Senate's package is similar to the administration first. Um, first of all, the, the Senate includes uh, uh, $25 million for reentry programming. Uh, it's similar to the uh, reentry programs that Ms. Bosler just described, only the amount is $25 million uh, instead of the $49 million proposed by the administration. Uh, it also adopts the uh, $900,000 for the California Leadership uh, um, uh, Program that uh, Ms. Bodgler referred to. Um, and then it also adopts the uh, $11.3 million for the Integrated Services for Mentally Ill Parolees Program uh, with an additional $500,000 included for evaluation of that program. So those are the similarities. Uh, now let me highlight some of the, the, the differences. Uh, the Senate package includes $30 million to restore the Mentally Ill Offender Crime Reduction Program, or MIOCR. Uh, this is a program that existed in the late 2000s, was eliminated in 2009 as part of budget cuts. Uh, it provides uh, funding to sheriffs uh, for um, services for mentally ill, individuals who cycle in and out of the local jails. Um, the funding can be used flexibly. Typically it was used for housing and employment services um, as well as mental health treatment. Uh, the Senate also includes $20 million in recidivism reduction funds for the administrative office of the courts to administer a grant program to support collaborative courts uh, at the local level. Uh, it also includes uh, $1.5 million to complete an evaluation, a comprehensive evaluation of all of uh, CDCR's in-prison rehabilitation programs. Uh, and then finally, uh, there's $5 million from the Inmate Welfare Fund uh, to support an innovative grant program. Uh, this, is, this would be administered by CDCR, uh, and it would provide funding to nonprofit organizations that are currently providing uh, successful and evidence-based innovative programs in prisons. Uh, the idea would be to expand these, these types of programs to prisons that don't have a lot of resources currently, uh, like San Quentin that happens to be close to an urban area where there are a lot of uh, organizations that come in and provide services. The idea here would be expand to more remote institutions that don't have those types of resources available. Uh, and then uh, the, uh, on page 14 of your agenda, there are also um, a, uh, there's about $44 million worth of uh, general fund proposals to supplement the, the proposals that I just uh, described. Uh, I'll walk through those really quickly. Um, the first is uh, uh, $11.8 11 .8 million for in-prison substance abuse treatments is similar to the administration's proposal uh, with one modification in that the, there would be trailer bill language that would require CDCR to expand an existing program which trains uh, inmates to serve as uh, drug treatment counselors to their peers in prison. It's currently a small program only at a couple of prisons, and this would require that it gets expanded to, to the remaining 34 prisons. <clears throat> uh, in addition to that, there's uh, a, a, another $20 million for the uh, MIOCR uh, program, making that a total of $50 million, uh, to, including the $30 million from the recidivism reduction fund and the $20 million from the general fund. Uh, and then... There's $3 million for uh, community colleges to develop a grant program. 
uh, which would uh, develop adult vocational training to be delivered uh, in state prisons. And then finally, the Senate package uh, proposes uh, $9 million to repeal uh, what is currently a lifetime ban on participation in the CalWORKs and CalFresh programs uh, for individuals who have been convicted of uh, drug felonies. Great. Thank you for that. A couple of questions. On page 13, the $1.5 million for an evaluation of all the rehabilitation programming that we're doing at CDCR makes great sense. Do you have a figure for what we do spend on rehabilitation currently? I've got a note of $350 million. Is that I, I don't have the precise number, but $350 million sounds in the ballpark, yes. Very good. And then with regard to the reestablishment of the MIOCA program, $30 million, what did we used to fund in years past? Was it closer to a couple hundred million? Uh, I think it was less than that. Um, you have that number here. Let's see. Um, so, uh, I think it was in the tens of millions. Um, okay. That's fine. Yeah. If you can get that to us later. Sure. So, I want to thank Senator Hancock not only for your review of the governor's proposal in your subcommittee, but also helping to craft what I think is a really thoughtful way to get to the core of our chronic overcrowding, which is the fact that we have this exceedingly high, higher than any other state recidivism rate. And as I mentioned, I think in a subcommittee hearing at one point, that when we use the word recidivism and recidivate, it's rather clinical. What's really going on every time someone recidivates is we have re-victimization. We have another victim in the state of California. Someone's getting hurt in one way or another. And to the degree that we can lower our re-victimization rate, we not only reduce our inmate population, we address our overcrowding, we help someone get on the straight and narrow, we help someone assist his or her family, and strengthen the community from which they come. So this is not an insignificant and important task for us to finally really get to the heart of it. So again, Senator Hancock, thank you. And with regard to this $5 million for Innovative Programming Grant, I joined you and Senator Mitchell at your subcommittee hearing, informational hearing, and we heard the most inspiring <coughs> stories of successful programs. And uh, LAO is right, many of them do exist at San Quentin because there are volunteers within the Bay Area who are able to put some time and effort into many of these programs, but they shouldn't be limited to San Quentin. There's a need throughout the state, and to the degree that we can enlarge the opportunities for the success of these programs throughout the state, I think will be great. This, uh, one of them we heard from at San Quentin I'm familiar with. I've been to their graduation ceremony. It's called GRIP. The acronym stands for Guiding Rage into Peace. And there are folks who take on the role of being a substitute victim for someone who has committed a violent crime, a surrogate, it's a surrogate victim, to be able to tell that individual story. And if I can, one in particular, and I won't go on too long here, I know we're short on time, but uh, a woman who had the very tragic situation of losing her mother to a violent crime, the perpetrator was her father. So she not only experienced the tragedy of the victimization, but she also, by losing her mother, she also lost her father because he, of course, went off to serve a life term for the murder. And she has this unique perspective. So she volunteers her time to go into San Quentin and to share her experience with inmates who themselves have been the perpetrators of violent crime to get them to understand what the kind of pain they caused to the victims of their crimes. And these men in this program make a commitment to peace and to 
understand what caused them to do such a horrific thing. They've only had a limited universe of folks who can participate from the program. It's in the couple dozens, I think. Their recidivism rate is zero. They have gotten to parole, and they've never committed another crime. So we know it's not always going to be zero, but rather than a 60, 65 percent recidivism rate, we can really cut it in half to a close to the national average. Uh, there are ways to do it. I think we're going to get there. Senator Hancock. Yeah, I um, wanted to also thank Senator Mitchell and Senator Anderson because yes, Senator we've Anderson had was there, of course, too. some really, um, I think, important and unanimous votes in our committee. I just wanted to point out that a number of these items are virtually identical in different ways to the administration. I think we're on the same page. Some of the big items that we're redirecting, like designing the Northern California facility, just seemed inappropriate for the recidivism fund, frankly, was designing a new facility with more jail beds. Um, but to, to sort of build on what Senator Leno said, um, I think the innovation grants can be very important in allowing us to expand innovative programs. Um, the GRIP program is absolutely one of them. Um, another one that we've seen at San Quentin is the horticulture program. And many of us have visited that program, and it's so interesting to hear what the inmates say about it, <laughs> which is that it is such a healing place to be, as well as work that they do, as well as the fact that there are actually jobs. If we could turn that into um, some system-wide vocational education, I, uh, former inmates can get jobs in landscaping, both with governments and um, in the private sector. And then also just to mention that the peer review, peer counseling that we're talking about having in the substance abuse treatment program, which is in several prisons now, and I have not only, again, seen the graduations of inmates who uh, complete their uh, university level coursework in substance abuse counseling, but then uh, um, have their supervised clinical hours supervised by psychologists and family therapists from the outside, uh, and they get their licensed clinical hours by giving substance abuse treatment to inmates, and they have waiting lists for the programs within the prison. It's actually the only cost-effective way I can see to bring to scale the amount of drug and substance abuse treatment uh, that we need in prisons without breaking the bank. And again, I've also met on the outside individuals now employed as drug and alcohol abuse counselors from those programs. So hopefully, um, you know, we'll be discussing many of these things in, uh, in the conference committee, but it does seem to me that we can meet the goals that have been set for us, and I know that we all have the same goal, which is removing the receivership by lowering recidivism, getting more efficient, effective uh, corrections, fewer victims, safer communities. So again, thank you, Senator Anderson and Senator Mitchell for your help, I think, um, and I, I would move the package. Thank you, Senator Hancock. Senator Nielsen. Mr. Chairman and members, uh, this is a very difficult issue for me, and I've looked at it firsthand more than most in California. In 1992, Governor Wilson appointed me chairman of the California Board of Prison Terms. And I saw all of this up front and personal. And I've watched over the decades the billions of dollars that went into CDCR's budget for meaningless programming or programming that in fact did not occur or that department redirected the rehabilitative dollars for other institutional purposes. There has been very little accountability of that organization. And one of the fundamental failures of realignment is that 
the bumping up of local rehabilitative options, opportunities, and programs was necessary before descending upon our public some 40,000 and growing unrehabilitated felons to already strap rehabilitation in the community. Now, this does provide rehabilitation. I'm happy to see that. This does provide some money for evaluation, but I cannot vote for this today. Number one, I don't trust CDCR, and I need some things to be very specific, and I'll probably raise those in the conference committee. If we are going to have evaluation, that also has to be very specifically done. And what do I mean in part by that? Historically, uh, CDCR would give anecdotal evidence of success. They would report enrollment of individuals in, say, AA, but that doesn't count. Being enrolled is not what counts. What counts is the completion of whatever the program is. That's a part of the accountability that has got to be built in to this whole situation of the rehabilitation in the community. And in addition, uh, just this very day, the bill I authored and was graciously co-authored by Senator Hancock was held in suspense that would provide means and resources for local government to report how recidivism and how programs were working in the community. We need that data and we need it much more specifically. It cannot be so general as far as I am concerned because I have seen it manipulated far too long. And that has been one of the essential failures of what rehabilitation has been provided in the institution and to a lesser degree in our communities over the years. Also, there have got to be consequences. If one is placed in a program and they do not participate, they walk away from, do not complete, there have to be consequences. And there aren't now. That's one thing realignment did. It diminished it to eliminated consequences for not participating in community programs. So there are many issues that, that cause me heartburn. There's no one more than me that re believes in the rehabilitation. But I have to see this more carefully crafted and, and done before I'm willing to vote for this much money, uh, particularly tr trusting it to CDCR, knowing how they have operated for so very many years. Thank you, Senator. Any other comments? We have a motion by Senator Hancock. Public comment on this? Good afternoon. My name is Selena Pryor Dansby, and I'm um, representing SCIU Local 1000. Um, we have educators in the prison system, in, um, CDCR, and they are the ones who teach the classes. And so, we're really happy to see um, money put in the budget for um, evaluation of the rehabilitative programs because we believe that um, our programs are effective and that we are effective as uh, with what we're doing there. Um, also, I wanted to point out that in 2004 and 2010 programming like the horticulture program that Senator Hancock mentioned was cut. Um, and so we would like to see those programs brought back as well um, before you go to um, bringing in the community colleges to teach vocational education. Um, we have some uh, reservations about the focus on career technical ed um, that might be provided at a lower cost within the existing program structure. Um, we would recommend that education beyond K-12 that would lead to an AA degree or higher or certification for a program that cannot be offered by CDCR. Um, we also would encourage local community colleges to form alliances with the correctional facilities in their areas. Um, all courses that, that are given should be administered by and use the facility from the local community college um, in order to ensure that credits from any coursework completed transfer to local community colleges in the four-year institution in the county where the inmate will parole. Um, we think that this should be a requirement prior to enrollment of the coursework. So. Um, we're just looking for some stronger language. We also want to make sure that our members' jobs are not supplanted. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, Mike Carroll with the Western Center on Law and Poverty. And we want to thank the subcommittee for uh, their um, restoring of both CalFresh and CalWORKs uh, eligibility for adults here. And in particular, the ability for adults coming out of the system to be able to get the childcare. 
um, employment services so that they can get a job, get out of poverty, and stay out of jail. We think this is a very important step forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Harold. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you very much. Uh, Mark Victoria representing Ask Me Local 2620. We represent the uh, psychologists and social workers and many others within the Department of Corrections as well as in the community and the parole outpatient clinics. We do appreciate you guys uh, looking at this and uh, seeing an increase in the amount of funds that are going to re uh, reduce recidivism. want to make sure that, you know, as we move forward that we are focusing on those institutions that the state is, uh, has and is currently providing um, a lot of these services for the mentally ill uh, individual parolee, parole population that's going out, as well as many of the sex offender uh, uh, population that's getting out there as well. So we just want to make sure that we are focusing on, on some of the uh, services that the state is currently providing as well, and not just depend on these contracted services that are out in the community. Thank you, Mr. Victoria. We have a motion. One more point. Yes, Senator Nielsen. Mr. Chairman, one more point. And your last speaker uh, caused me to remind myself that I had not mentioned this, that uh, lifetime ineligibility. That is pretty much a big deal. And I think even with the people of the state of California, they would not like to see that changed. But that said, I would argue that this is a fairly significant policy change that should be heard extensively in a policy committee. Thank you, Senator. Any other questions? Uh, we do have a motion by Senator Hancock. Uh, We've gone over both pages 13 and 14. Senator, take that motion for both pages. If there's not an objection, we can save a little time by taking that vote together. Then we'll move on to page 15, which is some trailer bill language related to 13 and 14. And then we'll also go back to page 10, which is a conforming item to the pages we're now about to vote on. So we're going to take one vote, page 13, page 14. Call the roll, please. Leno? Aye. Nielsen? No. Anderson? Aye. Bell? Aye. Berryhill? Block? Aye. Corbett? Aye. Hancock? Aye. Jackson? Aye. Lou? Mitchell? Aye. Monning? Aye. Morell? Roth? Aye. Torres? Weiland? 11 to 1. Pages 13 and 14. Pass on 11 to 1 votes. And then if we could go back to page 10 for this conforming item. Do we need to vote on that? We need to vote? No. Same vote. No need for that. We'll move on to page 15, which is the related trailer bill language. And uh, LAO, you might want to present on this. So the administration had proposed um, three pieces of trailer bill language here, um, deleting the authority for a community care facility reentry to basically give them the authority to enter into the reentry contracts uh, they had envisioned. Uh, also extending a current 60-day uh, jail reentry program to allow inmates to be put into that program for up to one year and establishing um, the, the authority for the Northern California reentry facility. Uh, the Senate uh, rejected the proposed trailer bill language and uh, adopted some placeholder trailer bill language, um, which uh, most of which uh, simply implements uh, the programs that we had described on the previous two pages. So I'll, I'll skip through most of that and just highlight a couple of the uh, uh, other pieces that we did not discuss already. Uh, first is uh, trailer bill language requiring that services be provided to individuals who have been released under uh, Proposition 36 of 2012. Um, these are uh, second strikers who were resentenced um, for nonviolent uh, um, uh, strikes. And uh, this would require CDCR to basically provide services uh, to, the, to that population. Uh, the, another piece of uh, legislation I'll highlight is uh, some placeholder language uh, related to 
a pilot program to modify how parole outpatient clinics currently operate. Um, those clinics currently provide some limited mental health treatment services and psychiatric medications to parolees who are mentally ill. Uh, this would be a pilot to expand the case management function within uh, some selected parole outpatient clinics uh, and really focus on the first 30 days after release for mentally ill parolees and provide them really comprehensive case management services, ensuring that they get enrolled into to Medi-Cal and that they find housing and, and have all of their needs met. Um, it would be, uh, uh, again, it's sort of a, a small pilot initially, perhaps to be expanded in the future. Thank you. Um, Senator Hancock's peer counseling for substance use treatment is included in this. Any questions for it? We'll have a motion by Senator Hancock. No comments or questions, no public comment. Call the roll, please. Leno? Aye. Nielsen? No. Anderson? No. Bell? Aye. Berryhill? Block? Aye. Corbett? Aye. Hancock? Aye. Jackson? Lou? Mitchell? Monning? Aye. Morell? Roth? Aye. Torres? Weiland? 7-2. Place that on call. Page 16. 